So we come to listen, uh, to explore this reading. Let's uh, just spend a moment in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for these words. Thank you for this story of such a um, such great ventures and yet such firm and stern opposition. Uh, Lord, this morning, as we explore those and what they mean for our lives, may you reveal them to us and speak to us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you may have heard of the movie Invictus. Has anybody seen Invictus? Yep. Great. Excellent. Thank you. A couple of Probably the people I'd expect to know, actually, but that's great. So, uh, Invictus, it's based on a true story of the Rugby World Cup Cup tournament held in South Africa in 1995. The newly elected President Nelson Mandela invited the captain of the South African team to unite the country, still reeling from the effect of apartheid through this game through this tournament by winning the tournament Mandela's hope is that by winning the tournament that they would join together in victory Uh, one of the highest highly successful teams they faced was the All Blacks from New Zealand as we had every other match the captain gathered the team training and preparing them trying to work out how best to uh, to uh, work out their tactics uh, looking at the, the uh, opposition's tactics, the dangerous players, making their plans to counter them. Standard stuff. But with the All Blacks, as much as they were concerned about the players and the tactics, they seemed at least as much concerned with the haka. If you're familiar with it, the war cry of the All Blacks, even before the first whistle went. There's some of the guys, the All Blacks, uh, doing that because... Of course, they're rugby players, so they're bigger than most of us mortals. So the comment that the captain made was that when they perform that war cry on the field, they're already halfway toward defeating their opposition. Well, today we hear a story much like that one of the uh, the opposition of the surrounding countries to Nehemiah's people rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. The people are so scared, it's debilitating. It's, uh, they nearly stop working altogether. And why not? They were facing a smashing military force. And not only that, they'd already beaten them once. A couple of weeks ago, we heard that Nehemiah expected opposition even before he left Persia. And that was why, before he set out to rebuild those walls... He made sure that he had the king's endorsement. Last week, we saw that he made that, wrong tri- uh, that long trip, and then once he arrived, rested up, investigated the state of the walls, and finally got the people together to get building. And in chapter 3, which we, we didn't read, it's a lot of names, and I would, just wouldn't do that to Helen. Um, <laughs> uh, the families all take a section of the wall. They're, Every family starts work and every, every household is, has a project within that whole great work. It's an amazing picture when you think about it. You've got, these weren't just some delegated work party. They were the same families who've been scattered, hidden, some of them even taking advantage of one another, as we'll see next week. There's nobles alongside of slaves working together. But as fragmented as they, once, as they were, once they started working together, it didn't just connect the, the different points of the wall. It connected the people as they worked together on that mission to bring glory back to God in his chosen city. And that can be equally true of the church too. If the people in the church all sit around while others do the work, they eventually get cranky at each other. It's, the, it's just the reality. It's, I've seen it before. I've worked with a number of churches trying to help them to work out how to make their way forward. And the ones that are really struggling, that's the problem. Thankfully, it's not the case here. There's many of us who are joining together in that task. 
if a church is committed in pursuing that mission together, that can change all sorts of things because we'll see God at work in us and appreciate Christ in one another as well. Then we read in chapter 4 that, uh, that threats from Sambalat and co um, have been coming through. Initially, it's just talk, ridiculing Nehemiah and the, and the job that all the people are doing, really just trying to discourage, undermine them, just getting them to stop. Even though they are words, though, from the, the prayer that Nehemiah raised in response, we can see that those words were hitting home. It rocked the confidence of the builders and perhaps, perhaps even Nehemiah himself. Nonetheless, the building got underway. The height was rising. The gaps were closing. It was beginning to look more like a wall than a no, set of jagged teeth. But as the building progresses, in spite of their threats, Sambalat, Tobiah and their peoples get really fired up. Soon rumours come back to Nehemiah and the Jews, so they, they gather together to pray. Regardless, even though the news was getting out even further, and the effects, sorry, and the, and the news continued to get out even further, the effects were growing. The builders were becoming weary, demotivated, living outside of the city were, um, and the people living outside the city were getting really nervous. Opposition was coming. It was imminent. The locals knew they were under threat. They were scared. They were preparing to be overcome by fear. They were pretty much overwhelmed. But as we see, said last week, Nehemiah was aware that there would be opposition to that building, to that rebuilding, he knew those around would be unhappy with the progress they made and would actively seek to stop it. He was ahead of it. He knew that. He had that knowledge of that opposition. And so it didn't discourage him from that project. In fact, it made him ready to face it. In Australia at the moment, we don't really face that kind of threat, do we? Many others do in many other countries, but we, we're pretty safe. But the reality is we can often find opposition to our faith, can't we? Some people openly ridicule us, decry the Christian faith and those that hold it. However, most of the time it's more subtle than that. Perhaps trying to get you to do things that they think will be contrary to your faith. Having a crack at you for being such a prude. Like a workmate of Ali's who decided it might be funny to make light of Jesus' death at Easter time. Sometimes people will see us as, as soft for feeling you know, upset about that or compassion. Or they might even see us as narrow-minded for standing up for Christian principles, particularly when they conflict with their own. Sometimes they might just shut you out. Some of us will experience more or less of those than others. But if we are doing as Paul wrote and making the most of every opportunity to give a reason for the hope that we have in Jesus himself, well, Jesus did say himself that we would expect opposition. But that opposition isn't always from physical forces. Sometimes it's within us. Temptation is real and something that Satan uses oh so very well. Jesus asked his first disciples to leave their nets and follow him, and they've done so ever since. We are called to lay everything that we are, everything that we do, and all that we have at God's feet. Not as a massive offering bowl, we're not going to put that out the front here for this week, we need a much bigger bowl probably, uh, but putting it, um, rather, God wants us to be the one who God wants, sorry, God wants to be the one who sets our priorities in what we do with those things. He has given, us, given them to us to use for his kingdom work. So he wants us to listen to him about what we do with them. That's not what Satan wants. He wants us to think that we can do that a little, but we can still keep a little bit back for ourselves, for the things that we want to do, 
that we know God wouldn't be happy with. Those thoughts weasel into our minds, and if we leave them unchecked, they lead to, lead to action. And then stage a gradual takeover, an invasion of our hearts, allowing us eventually to turf God out. That's what Satan, Satan's agenda is for us. So how did Nehemiah face opposition in his case? And what can it tell us about how we can face opposition of our own? Well, here's the first thing. God is invincible. It might sound obvious. God created all things, has a plan for all things. He has eternity at his fingertips. He loves us. He works all things together for us. He has active, acted extravagantly through his son, Jesus, to save us. There is nothing we can do to shake him or his power or his plans. And yet, sometimes we can still find ourselves thinking that he's not quite big enough. Perhaps the situation is something that you know, we don't think he's concerned about. Maybe we're concerned that we aren't strong enough to defend him. Maybe we even think we have to win the battle against the powers of darkness for him. Here's the news. He never leaves us. He never stops loving us. He is bigger than anything we will face and he has already won. Never doubt that God is invincible. That's what Paul is talking about in Philippians 4 when he looks at prayer and that peace that transcends all understanding. That peace can only come from a God who has all those things in his hands, not from anything we can do for ourselves, not serving our own needs. The things that yell at us are the things we hear, the people in front of us, the real, live and intangible ones. But the peace, that comes from someone who, while unseen, is far more solid, far more permanent, trustworthy and powerful than any of them to look to God for peace in the middle of the chaos the second is one that we uh, spent time on last week prayer pray for God to do what you can't what do you do when you find yourself out of your depth my first ten tendency is to work out what I can do to resolve it What's the fix? What's the solution? How can I make it better? But look at what Nehemiah does at the first rumblings from Sambalat. He doesn't try to put Sambalat out of the game, mount a massive strategy against him and remove the threat. Instead, Nehemiah does the best thing he could possibly do. He prays. He gives it over to God. You know, when we go in and try to bring, those, uh, bring down those who are giving us grief about our faith, we aren't honouring God in doing that at all. In fact, what we are saying is that we don't trust God to do a good enough job. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, as Moses declared in Deuteronomy 32, 35. Uh, back in the old King James... If we try to do it ourselves, we are doing God's work and we will do it worse. Instead, pray to God, ask him to intervene and trust in his wisdom. There was a friend of, um, friend of mine who was a pastor and uh, we were away on a uh, youth conference together and a young bloke came up to him one afternoon and just started bellowing at him, telling him, he, he obviously wasn't a Christian, and just started bellowing at him, all those things that were wrong with Christianity. Why do you even run these things? What, what's the point? You're just going to lead us all down the garden path? And then gave all sorts of reasons for that. My friend just sat there and prayed for him, was polite to him, and kept on telling him that God loved him that Jesus, had, Jesus loved him, 
that Jesus came to die for him, rose again, and there is nothing now that, does, that can keep him from God's love if he will accept it. After that afternoon, the next day, he decided he was going to follow Jesus. It was, it was like the last, last attempt of Satan, really, to try and tip him over, and not just him, trying to have a crack at the pastor as well. I ended up working, up, working with that guy. Uh, he's uh, currently taken over my job at Scripture Union, which is great. So, if we try and fight it in our own strength, we will do a much worse job than if God does it in his wisdom and his strength and his love. Here's the third one. Act in faith and unity. Finally, while Nehemiah doesn't attack, he does take precautions. Rather than undermining the oncoming armies, he acts to make sure that he and the Jews have done what they can to be ready for that opposition. A defence is mounted. The people are armed and they will fight it together if attacked. I've often heard people arguing the merits and appropriateness of prayer versus action. When I was overseeing outreach programs, I would regularly have people coming to complain that we spent too much time praying when we ought to be out there doing, reaching people with the faith, while others would complain, coming to me, uh, that we were doing, um, that, sorry, we, while we were doing so much, why weren't we spending more time in prayer? Each side seemed to think that either prayer or action was more important, we should be doing more of them. But Nehemiah has no such dilemma. He prays, yep, and he acts. But he acts in faith that God will be at work through his actions, answering those prayers. And what's more, when he needed to act, when, he, uh, when the, uh, the attack came to a part of the wall, the people aren't just to fight for their own patch and leave others to their own devices. They would join together where the trumpet sounded. All of the people would come and fight for every one of the people. And as they would do so, God would come and fight for them all himself. You know, when we are there for each other, God is there also. He will minister to us through that encounter. I've had countless times when I've been in a conversation with someone who faces a challenge or a concern and found that I had the words for them that I didn't even know that I had. God has ministered to that person through me. And through them, I've grown myself and been encouraged. When we stand beside each other, God stands there too. Remember that God is invincible. Pray to him and act in faith together. Finally, let me just give you two quick hints to help us to face those challenges. First one is this. Don't do the opposition's work for them. The people with Nehemiah had enough problems with Sambalat and his mates, but as time went on, they actually started doing some of Sambalat's propaganda for him. That was very nice, wasn't it? They're telling each other how scared they should be of the oncoming forces. They almost did Sambalat out of a job. They almost just stopped working. When we are discouraged, it is very easy to fall into discouraging others. Don't do it. If I'm struggling to share my faith with my friends, should I be discouraging you from doing the same? Not at all. But what I can do is pray for you and identify you with you, maybe even share what I've learned from that experience when you're having the same issues. But let's not do the work of the opposition for them. And the second one is this. Be ready. I love the picture of the people rebuilding the wall in this chapter. It's, yes, you've got the guards there, but you've got the, uh, all the, the builders there with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. It reminds my, um, <laughs> my uh, grandfather was, a, I said before, a bricklayer, a builder. And uh, he was, um, one time, 
uh, the union boys came around, this is quite some time ago, the, boy, the union boys came around and asked him why he wasn't part of the union. And they weren't men in suits, they were thugs. And they uh, came and knocked in his, uh, on his door, he just home, family inside, and were prepared to rough him up a little bit if uh, he didn't go with it. Um, didn't work so well for them. Um, my grandfather was a bit of a rat bag himself and they went home a little bit sore and sorry. <laughs> so they were working, but in this case, they're working there. They're doing their job, but they're ready for the opposition at the same time. The scriptures tell us to do the same in a spiritual sense. Ephesians 6 talks of the armour of God that we are to put on. on. It says up there, Therefore put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. And what is that? It's the belt of truth to stop doubts coming into your mind. It's the breastplate of righteousness, covering your heart and ensuring you continue to act righteously. The shoes of readiness, ready to share the good news of Jesus to others. The shield of faith to ensure that Satan doesn't cause us to doubt God's love and his forgiveness offered freely to us. The helmet of salvation to ensure that we keep our hearts sure and and certain of the grace of God. And finally, the sword of God's word. The only weapon we ever need carry is Jesus and the Bible itself. If we keep our mind on each part of that armour, if we invest in prayer, if we continue to love and pray for one another, we will have all that we need to ensure that we can see off any earthly or spiritual opposition we face. And that is the greatest strength that any of us can hold. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this story. We thank you for this really concrete example of what opposition could look like. But Lord, thank you also for showing us how Nehemiah dealt with these things, not by going and attacking another, another neighbouring force, not by just carrying in a, in, a, in a hole and just stopping everything from happening, but by being ready, ready in the way that you would prepare him to be, and that you, yourself, are prepared to fight for him. Thank you, Lord, that when we stand for you, that you are always ready to fight for us, to watch over us. Lord, we pray that in those times we'll trust you. We'll trust you to act in the ways that will, watch, will be good for us. But even more than that, that will be great for your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for these things. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to our final hymn this morning.